launch in. We are now recording. Um, and so as you all know, those of you who've been with us for a while and those of you who are new, um, we do record our sessions and then they are placed on our YouTube site um, for further review or to share with other staff members who are unable to be with us um, at our meetings. And so let's go ahead and get started. Go to the next slide. So I'm just gonna go over um, a few updates and then I'm gonna, um, as always, turn it over to my team for their uh, unit updates. And so just wanna make sure, um, and I mentioned it before, but we do have a new um, org structure here at DFSS. It is leaner um, that, than it was in the past and we will make sure that everyone gets a copy of our new um, org structure. Um, we do know that we went through a competitive grant application um, we were awarded. We do have the largest um, grant here in the city um, at, as an outcome of that competition. But what that also meant was if we did get a reduction in our Head Start, early Head Start funding. Um, and so commensurate with that, we did do some uh, shifting um, in our division. Um, we did have um, some individuals who uh, were with us uh, before the end of the year who are no longer members of the Children's Services team. And we do wish them all well. Um, some of them were, for example, individuals who were on our hearing and vision team um, that may, many of you may have worked with for them coming out to your sites and doing hear, hearing and vision. Um, we also had a couple of other individuals who uh, were on the team, um, Seth Rich, who had joined our team um, and was an AD. Um, in addition to that, uh, Rhonda, um, who had been with us for many, many years, um, is now at a, in another um, division here at Department of Family and Support Services. But with that said, we did restructure. We have a leaner management side of our house. Um, and one of the things that you will notice more notably for those of you who um, are working directly with our operations team um, is that we did restructure that team. Um, Elaine Millsap Parker um, is the as assistant director over that unit or that portion of the unit. In line with that, she's got two supervisors under her. We did um, have four. Uh, we currently do now have two. Um, and so Jacinta and Nicole um, are the two supervisors. They each now in the restructure are managing two teams instead of one. Um, so again, we will be getting um, that org structure out to you, but there are some changes. Um, leaner, mean, meaner, that's okay. Um, um, and our plan is to continue to successfully um, operate our side of this, this work. Um, but also remember and remind you that we are here for you and we will continue to support you um, through the years with um, Head Start and state funding. So again, there has been some shiftings and, and some changing and you will actually see it in print, but just wanted to make sure that you understand that we do have an, a new work structure here at DFSS and Children's Services Division. Uh, Tiffany is still the manager. Um, we do have a vacancy for a manager. She's you know, over, you know, I'm gonna say everybody out here, be nice to my team. <laughs> um, when we say leaner, the, of course, what you do understand, I'm sure all of your work didn't go away, um, but we don't have as many people. Um, and so we're trying to make, make sure we get a handle on all of that um, in support of the work that everyone is doing. And so not to say that we're not going to be responsive to you. I just want you to understand um, that with our restructure, we do have fewer people um, in the division. And um, as a result of that, there are some people who are doing uh, more have taken on some other parts of the work, et cetera. Um, but just be nice to them. That's all I'm asking um, here in 2022. So um, the next um, item on my agenda here for me is contract underspend. Uh, one of the things that we've been asking everyone to do is do monthly invoicing in order for us to work with you to help you and us understand how our grants are working and what dollars are going out of the door. We really do need monthly invoicing. That will assist us in being able to work with you on doing what could be available to you um, with our ability to work with you on a budget revision. What is happening is we're getting all the way down to the wire too late for a revision. You've underspent, and I will tell you that we are turning money back to the state, for example. We can't afford to continue to do that. This is not a process that we can continue to do. Um, we will be working closely with all of you. Um, we will have a meeting, just so you know, with specifically with those of you who are funded through ECBG, PFA, and PI, where we will talk more to you about what this is and its impact. 
making sure that you understand what this looks like on our side. But you know, in this time, one of the things that we should not be doing is we should not be turning money back. Uh, you as organizations need these dollars to support the work that you do. Um, you are doing so much in beh on behalf of children and families and we know there's a cost to that. Um, and we should not be turning money back. But at the end of our last fiscal year, we did um, actually have massive underspend. I know some of that is due to the fact that we've been in a pandemic for the last couple of years. I know some of that is understaffing. But what we will be doing is working with you because we need to get a, a story behind all of that. Um, so we will be working with you. Again, we will have a meeting. And this is specific uh, to those of you that are on our ECBG or PFAPI funding so that we can talk more about this and making sure that we're on top of what we need to be doing uh, so that we are better stewards of those dollars here at DFSS. And so again, monthly invoicing required. If you need to talk about that, you know, if you've got a question about it, you know that you can reach out uh, to Tiffany, but you can also, um, and we've had her speak with you before, and that's Nicole Roberts and our finance team. Um, but again, monthly invoicing, get those invoices in. And I am going to say, I know there's been delays. I know that there's been some issues with our Office of Budget and Management and staffing and all of that. So I'm not saying none of that is happening, but I do wanna to say to you that we really, really need to get you on board with getting these things in so that we're able to work with you so that we can look to see, is there some changes and shifting that we can do on your behalf um, before you're literally just turning money back. Um, and so I'm not gonna keep harping on that. Just again, we will be meeting with you and getting more deeply um, and more granular um, in our talk with you. Um, one of the, the other things I wanna talk to you about is reporting under the block grant, um, which is ECBG. Um, I know my team works with you. I know they're asking you for information. That IEIN number is required. It's not optional. It is required. And so uh, working with the team to make sure you're able to get that into the system, that number then identifies that teacher um, in that classroom, and that then allows that classroom to be countable. If we don't have a staff member with the right credential with an IEIN, um, ISBE is turning back that classroom and saying it is not fundable. And so we're going to talk about that as well when we talk. But these are the kind of issues that we run into each time we're trying to do our reporting. And it really stum you know, stumbling blocks in front of us here at DFSS. And then I know there are stumbling blocks in front of you out there as well. And we've really got to work on that um, and making sure that our reporting is accurate and up to date and that we can then um, adhere to the reporting timelines that we have uh, from CPS for their report to, to ISB or um, ISBE. And so we just want to partner with you in this and we want to get ahead of it uh, versus behind. One of the other issues that we're finding in reporting and what's going into the system um, is I just want to remind you, in order for a family to be eligible for that block grant, they have to have a Chicago address. They can't be Cicero. They can't be on the outskirts on the other side of, of the city. They can't be on the outskirts on the west side, north side, et cetera, meaning outside of the city proper. If they are, don't have a city address, that family is not eligible for ECBG. And we're having to pull those children out and go back for verification back to agencies. But what I need your staff who are putting in enrolling families is if it's not a Chicago address, work with that family because that, that family, that child is not countable um, because they are not in the city. And these, that fund is only for city uh, residents. And so I just, just in, want to impress upon you how important it is uh, for you to make sure on your side of this that when families are being enrolled, that you're making sure that these are accurate so that my team doesn't have to spend a week or two, you know, back and forth and back and forth trying to clean data um, that is going to ISB, uh, to CPS and then to ISB. And so just, just asking you uh, to work with us. And then again, when you're enrolling, we need complete data. Um, they've gone over and talked about all of the data points that need to be in there in order to consider this a complete enrollment. And we're still finding that there are gaps in the staff here at DFSS are having to come back and ask over and over again uh, for that data. The reason I'm saying all of that to you is this. One of the things that we're going to get to, we're not there yet, but that report's going to go directly from us directly to um, CPS without us being able to go back to you to clean your data. And what we're trying to do is get everybody on board with understanding it has to be right from the outset and fewer issues and problems with that data. Um, because again, if it goes as a direct submit, 
then the time that we spend trying to work with you to make sure your classes are countable, they simply would not because it would go directly to the funder. They would see the gap. They'd see that this is a classroom um, that doesn't have a qualified staff. They'd see immediately that there's an um, a address outside of the city of Chicago and all of those are just simply gonna be lined out. So we're gonna be working with you in more detail, making sure that we're getting this data right. Uh, because again, we need to expend all of these dollars and this is a part of underspend as well. Um, the last one that has to do again with, with dollars that are coming out of that uh, particular fund is doula programs. Doula uh, programs is funded directly through our PI fund and they have to be enrolled in COPA. I know the team was trying to set up some training to make sure everybody understood what needed to go in COPA. I understand people did not attend, not beating up anybody over that today, but I am saying to you uh, that your families need to be enrolled. If they're not enrolled, they're not counted and they're not, I can't continue to fund when I don't have families. And so we're standing on a cusp here where we've got to get those families um, into the system. So it is, again, a funding that is countable, meaning that PI fund. Understand everything that I just talked about is coming back to that ECBG grant. And these are all issues on one grant. And we've got to fix it, people. We've had this grant for far too long uh, for us to have these kinds of uh, problems. And so what I'm asking you to do is work with your teams to make sure that they're doing the entry that is required to make sure that your families are actually enrolled, fully enrolled, meaning, meaning all data elements are in there so that there's no children on your side that my team is going to call you and say, in that classroom, you can only be, you can only bill for three because 17 records are not complete, but we're going to get there if we can't fix this. And so I'm saying this today on um, what it is that I need from you. My team will be following up. And again, we will have a meeting with those of you that are funded by the Black Grant and be much more granular um, in our conversation with you about where we see you are and what we see, what else is needed. Um, one last thing, and then I'm going to answer your uh, question in the chat, Megan. Um, one of the things that I do know, and I recognize that we are un we're suffering for staff out there. The one thing that I need from all of you is your recruitment efforts in staffing your classrooms. Are you putting out things on LinkedIn? Where are you marketing yourself? We need a report from you on your ability and what you're doing to try to find staff in your classrooms. That's gonna be a part of this reporting. I'm just putting that out there in front of you. Uh, we need to not just say we don't have staff. We've gotta make sure that you can identify and talk about what you're doing to try to fill those vacancies uh, in your programs. And I know you're doing it, but we're gonna to have to get some documentation from you um, on your efforts. And so please begin the process of working with your HR or whomever is doing that part of your work uh, to pull together a report on your recruitment efforts specific to your staffing, your programs, your classrooms, those funded positions um, at your organizations. What are you doing to fill those vacancies? I know it's hard. I know that we are suffering in Illinois, in the city of Chicago and nationally. Uh, for people to work in this field. So please don't think that I'm saying this because I don't think you're not trying, but documentation, because if it's not documented, it's not happening, people. And I need the documentation to show what your efforts are. I don't have it today. And so I'm going to, I'm asking you for that now um, and pressing upon you how important having this information uh, will be for us and for you as we move forward with this grant. So to your question, uh, Megan, before I talk about vaccine mandates, um, what I'm saying about a city address. If these are parents that and children that you are planning to fund on ECBG in a PFA classroom or a PI classroom, that classroom has to have children in it who live in the city of Chicago. I'm talking specifically, the city address is specific to the families you are serving. They have to have a Chicago address. That fund, that ECBG fund, we're funded directly from CPS. We are funded to serve children in the city of Chicago. And so we're finding that there's some addresses that are going into COPA for families whose address is in suburban communities and we cannot fund them on our city of Chicago block grant. And so I'm just asking everyone to make sure if you're enrolling a family in ECBG that they have a Chicago address, okay? Now, it was not about staff. This is about the families that you're serving, okay? So I hope that's clear for you. Last piece, vaccine mandates. You're very welcome, Megan. Um, vaccine mandates, you've heard that we do have mandates where um, staff are required to have um, their vaccines. Um, in COPA, you can put in their vaccine status. 
um, because we need to be able to document that we're adhering to this. I know that many of you have already heard that there's some lawsuits from some states regarding vaccine mandates for organizations who have 100 or 200 or more employees. Yes, they are um, saying that to the government, to the federal government, they don't want to do this. I get that. You know that. One of the things that I do know um, and what we've gotten back from Office of Head Start, Illinois was not a state that is wrapped up in those lawsuits. And for those of us who are not in those states, we are moving forward with a federal mandate and state mandate regarding vaccines. Um, and so we do have to have documentation that your staff have been vaccinated in order for you then to claim them on your vouchers. Because again, there's a state and federal mandate uh, for staff to be vaccinated. Um, if the family, if your staff member has um, a documentation as to why they are not or cannot be vaccinated and that waiver has been accepted, then that's fine. But if they are not and don't have that, they need to have been vaccinated. We're at the end of December and right now, you only have a day or so uh, to be able to document that your staff are vaccinated for the federal government. And so I'm asking you to make sure uh, that you are doing what you do, your due diligence on your side. I talked before about the need for you to look at your policies and procedures. I know you have vaccine mandates for uh, staff who are born after a certain date because they're vaccines that are required. You have vaccine requirements for your families, your children and families, um, because that's required for licensing. And so what I was asking you to do is look at it and make sure that you included COVID vaccines. Update that so that you are able to hold your staff accountable uh, for this requirement that you now are living under. Um, and so again, just please work with us to make sure that all of that is being done uh, so that we're all in compliance, both for state and federal. I'm gonna go to chat really quickly and then I'm gonna turn it over. Um, again, it's not for staff. This is just about families and children when I talked about ECBG. Um, is, DS, is DFSS still providing a job fair um, that was discussed? Yes, there is a job fair coming up. Um, I know William's gonna be on for a short minute um, and he might be able to talk a little bit about that, but that will be a first, that will not be for us the only, we've done others and we will continue to do uh, whatever we can to support you um, in finding staff. Um, the families children funded with PI or PFA grants need to live in Chicago, absolutely. Uh, they need to live in the city of Chicago. It is a Chicago fund. Um, we get our dollars from CPS. CPS is our um, LEA in the city of Chicago, our largest um, education organization, CPS. That's where our funds come from. They serve Chicago residents. Our, fund should, our funds also fund Chicago residents. Our PA, PI home visiting staff required to be vaccinated. Um, as far as the state of Illinois is, yes. We have been allowing weekly testing or vaccination, um, weekly, weekly testing if they cannot be vaccinated. But now that we're at the point where the mandate is there, weekly testing is only done for those who have um, been or received, for example, a waiver for vaccine due to health or whatever. Um, but everyone else is supposed to be vaccinated. Um, and there's really no more time in the calendar because we're at the end of the of, uh, January. And so people really need to go and make sure that they're getting it. And we can send back the information out one more time to everybody so that you have it. But we do have to ensure um, that people are doing exactly what's being required. And that's the um, COVID vaccine. Um, the deadline for, and I'm not going to give you a deadline for entering um, information into COPA. The deadlines are around them actually getting vaccinated. And so what I'm asking everybody to do right now is start going in if you have not and start putting your information in COPA for all of your staff who have vaccines so that we can make sure that our staff on this side can go in and document that as they're looking at your staff and your agencies. And so I know it's, it's gathering records, is getting documentation from your staff. So I get all of that. But we're here now where the vaccine itself has already been mandated that it be done in January of 2022. So you should now be receiving and getting the documentation that you need uh, to go ahead and start putting it into uh, COPA. It should all be in there by next month. Why? Because the vaccine mandate is January of 2022. Um, and so Anya, as far as I'm concerned, we, don't, we only have weeks after the mandate closes uh, for everybody to get everything in there and that will be February of 2022. Uh, can you repeat one more time about reimbursement for unvaccinated staff? 
what I'm saying is if there's a vaccine mandate that says in order for us to pay you for a staff member, and the federal government has been very, very clear that there's a federal mandate. And if you're not vaccinated, I can't then have that, fan, that staff member on our voucher um, because that person did not, you did not adhere to the federal mandate of making sure your staff were vaccinated, therefore um, operating what we would consider safe and healthy environments for yourself, children, and families. And so again, if, you, if they have a waiver and that waiver has been approved and accepted, that's fine. But unvaccinated staff, if you have staff on board who have not been vaccinated, you won't be able to bill for those individuals. We're going to have to do our due diligence on our side of this. And that's why we um, updated COPA to be able to put that in there so that we can see who is and who is not. Um, so that we'll be working to make sure that we are compliant. We have to be compliant in order to make sure all of you don't lose your funding. So I'm asking you to work with us and making sure that you're adhering, getting your staff to understand the requirement for vaccination. Um, and you on your side of the house will make some determinants about people who are saying they know they're not going to do it. Um, what are you going to do as an organization? That's why I was asking you to update your policies and procedures. Weekly testing is only accurate as I was just mentioning, if for example, there's a waiver that says that person cannot be vaccinated. Just weekly testing does not meet the mandate. Uh, no longer does it meet the mandate. We're past that. Um, is there a specific tab on the staff record in COPA that you need? The vaccination information, I'm going to ask one of our operations staff um, when they are doing their report to talk about exactly where it is in COPA. I don't want to send you on a phishing mechanism. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it up to my staff to tell you exactly where it goes. Um, but yes, there is somewhere in COPA where that information can be updated. Um, if a person needs a waiver, they need to go to their physician. Their doctor needs to say why they can't be vaccinated. They need to, they need to say if it's something that's go, going on with that individual where that person cannot be uh, vaccinated. You don't have the authority as an organization uh, to, to decide that a staff member um, gets, gets or does not get a vaccine. Um, you can look at CDC. You can look at the um, e-click and read about what the uh, federal government is saying about it. Um, but just weekly testing does, won't get us uh, past this. That was what we could do in 2021, excuse me, we're in 2022 now where the mandate is taken hold. And possi any possibility of waivers can be used for teacher assistants that do not meet all credential requirements. We're working with Office of Head Start now to figure out, for example, what all we are going to be able to do. Um, and we do need to look at what we need to create um, in order to go back to Office of Head Start. That's why one of the things that I'm asking everybody to do, and when I was talking, and let me be more specific, when I'm talking about your recruitment efforts about staff, I need everybody to do a recruitment plan about what you're doing, federal and state, uh, so that we know exactly what you're doing and what you're up against as far as getting individuals in your programs, um, which will be information that's gonna help me in going back to Office of Head Start and talking about um, the possibility of a waiver, period. Uh, for credentials, but I need more granular data from my organizations in order to create that. So we'll be working with you on what's needed in order, in order for us to move forward with that, Linda. Uh, please send out the information. We will get the information back out there um, on um, state mandate, uh, which would be the state mandate for you are funded by a state grant, which is ECBG, um, and our governor put out a vaccine mandate as well. And so, yes, we'll get information back out there so everybody has it in your hand. Um, do I want the card uploaded into eDocs? Right now, I'm not asking that the card itself be uploaded into eDocs unless that's what my staff has said. <laughs> what I'm asking you to do is go in. We updated COPA to make sure that it is in COPA. Um, and taking that information and putting those dates for those vaccines so that we can say that this person has been vaccinated is what we're doing right now. Um, the booster right now, I'm going to say is the two shots are required. No one has mandated the booster. Um, and so right now I don't have a mandate for the booster. Um, I'm gonna give you a little personal story. I had both, both vaccinations and I was boosted. And over the holiday, I came down with COVID and I turned 66 around that same time. And I thank God that I had both and then a booster because I was able to take care of myself at home. I am still with you today could have been different, could have been worse. And so I'm not the one who's out here telling everybody what to do, but I'm gonna tell you, it worked for me, people, okay? <laughs> so is it is it optional? That's a personal choice. 
but I'm going to tell you that we need to be listening to science and we need to be thinking about what we need to do for ourselves. When they started talking about vaccines for polio and people didn't necessarily want to do it, we got everybody vaccinated against polio and we eradicated polio. We're sitting here now, we're still trying to get people to get a vaccine for something that is wreaking havoc and taking lives every day. I lost, as I'm at home struggling with, with COVID, one of my family members died from COVID. This has got to stop people. You know, I'm, I'm, going to get, I'm not going to take the whole meeting in talking about what we need to do, but if we're going to be safe, if we're going to provide the safest early learning environments we can for our staff, for ourselves, for our children and our families, the only defense you have right now is a vaccine. I'll get off my soapbox. Um, and again, the booster right now by the CDC is optional. They're even talking about a fourth shot. That's a whole nother story. Um, but again, let's do what we got to do to keep ourselves safe and healthy people. That's all I'm asking you to do. Um, is, it, is the COVID vaccine required for staff for non-Head Start, early Head Start staff working in PI? COVID vaccine, I'm going to say this, and I, I, I don't know. I get, I get to say things like that because I turned 66 in December, okay? <laughs> I don't think the COVID vaccine uh, should be a non-requirement for anyone. That, that's just where I sit. I've seen too many people who've passed away as a, as a result of this virus, and I've seen the difference when people um, have been vaccinated. The state, which is PI, the federal government, which is Head Start, Early Head Start, are both saying the same thing to you that we want to make sure that people are safe and are healthy. And the only way we can cut down on transmission um, is that people are vaccinated. And so is it required for staff, for non-Head Start, early Head Start staff, working in PI, PI estate? Our governor put out a mandate, so you are required. Head Start, early Head Start, our president put out a requirement, so you're required. So for the funding that we have, there's a requirement across PFA, PI, Head Start, Early Head Start, Early Head Start Expansion, and CCP. And if you work for the city of Chicago, as we do, we as city employees are also required to do it. And so, again, every funding source we have requires that your staff be vaccinated. There is no option um, that allows for me to come back to you and say your funding doesn't require it. It does. We were very much under the impression that weekly testing was an okay alternative to vaccine for PI-funded non-center-based staff. Right now, that has been it. I'm going to follow up again um, and make sure, but what is in the current mandate, it talks about the vaccination itself. And so I will go back through it again, Catherine. I will make sure that I'm giving you the right information because I'm not one for giving the wrong information. And if I'm wrong, I say I'm wrong. But what I am saying to you is the governor did put out a mandate and I understand if they're non-center-based, but let me ask you this. Your non-center-based home visiting staff are going into places where they need to be protected. Let's think about the protection of your staff. Let's think about their life and the lives of those that are, they're coming in contact with as we're thinking about what we're saying we need or need not do. We can always look at every um, request for us to do anything and we can and we always do make a determinant which one is more effective and what is the best one for us when we're thinking about what we need to do. And I need you to think about the safety of your program and the safety of your staff as you're yeah. thinking. I 100% I agree with all of that. It was just that we were we were told by the other entities that do home visiting in the state that the mandate for us was either weekly testing or vaccination. I've right. been fine with the mandate for vaccines since like April. Like, Absolutely. I'm on board, but like <laughs> our staff and our HR department and everybody has been like our whole agency has said weekly testing is okay. So we're gonna, if that's true, if it really does apply to us in the same way that Head Start does, then we need to, I need to call my HR person like immediately, we need to rewrite our, our uh, policy. So that's why I was like asking so many times. Yes, yes. Not that and I'm I, against it. Fully no, 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 no. And I get that, Catherine. Totally you and I can fine. touch base offline uh, so that okay. I can assist you. But again, let's go back to it. Make sure that we're okay. saying the right thing, but also you as an organization can be most restrictive you don't have to be least restrictive. You can think about the safety of your staff when you're writing your organizational policy. Um, and right. that's what you're able to do. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, let's see, currently using staffing service to help with classroom vacancies. Can DFSS offer guidance on how to enter subs into COPA? 
Um, I'm going to uh, ask my staff to address that when we get to um, operations and what goes in COPA. And I will go come back to that and make sure that someone is as answering on that particular question. What is the effective date? I'm having some struggles getting this arrow to move. Will, what is the effective date for the employee vaccine mandate? Um, right now, <laughs> it is January at the end of this month. And so if a person hasn't had their, they have to at least have their first shot. And right now people need their first shot in order for that to happen, okay? And so the 31st is gonna be here in, in just 11 days. And so if we have not already had our first shot, there's no way right now for them to get the second shot in January because they have to be two to three weeks in between based on what they're getting unless they get the Johnson & Johnson. And so they're already not gonna get their second until February. And so, but they at least have to have their first by the end of the month. So you got 11 days, only five more, seven more, six more of those are working days. And so we're there now where we need to be working really hard and heavy to get this done. All right. So I'm just going through really quickly because I'm going to turn it over. Um, I see thank yous, January 31st is the, is the mandate that's in there. Um, and I, I can see there's a lot of other um, items in the chat. I'm gonna open up the chat, but right now I'm going to go ahead um, and turn it over. I think it's coming to you, Tiffany, for program admin. Um, and then I will look at the chat, see what else is in there and what else I can respond to. Thanks everyone. I just don't wanna take the entire meeting, but I just wanna emphasize um, the importance of all of what we're talking about. Thanks, Maria for putting the FAQs and the vaccine on man mandating, a masking um, in the chat is there for everyone. Thank you, and, and let me say this, I see people saying thank you for your loss. Um, I thank you for saying that. And I, and I brought it up only to remind all of us how fragile we are out here. Um, we're just a, a moment away from an illness that can do this. And, and this vaccine um, doesn't have a person on it that says just you. It's not an age, just you. There are many, many children that are now coming down with COVID than, than before under other variants. Uh, this is no joke, people. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. And I know when we closed our doors in March of 2020, none of us thought we'd still be in a pandemic in January of 2022. And we're only two months out from asking you to close your doors in 2020. And we're still fighting this. And again, I'm just gonna say it and I'm gonna get off of my soapbox. The only defense we have right now um, against this is one is vaccinations and two is all the mitigations that you've been doing in your programs, the masking and the extra cleaning and the sanitation and all of what you do every day. That's what's keeping us going in this field. And I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for your continuous and holding up and doing it. The next phase of this we hope is us getting on the other side and eradicating uh, this disease, but we know it mutates faster um, than uh, any of, of the other viruses that we've had out there. And so I'm not looking for, forward to the next iteration of this. I am looking forward to it being done. Um, and so just join me on that one. And, and then we can have a real celebration because um, then we can actually be in the same place and in front of each other. And so um, I, again, I thank everyone for your thoughts and for and everything. It's a difficult time uh, right now because it's, it's real. I'm just going to say to you, it's real people. So turning it over to you, Tiffany. Yes, we definitely appreciate the transparency, Cerezo, and you know, just you sharing um, with us um, such a personal story. Um, I think that we all were definitely touched by it. And um, as you mentioned, um, this has affected us one way or the other, um, us personally, those we know. So we definitely appreciate you for being um, open. Um, going to go ahead and go into the program admin updates. And so one of the first updates that I wanted to talk about was um, the, uh, the community assessment. Um, you know, the community assessment um, is something that um, according to the standards that we have to um, do every, every five years. So we have to have our quinquennial um, report out every five years, but it also is something that we're updating on an annual basis. And so one of the things, you know, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned as we are going into a different, uh, a new planning cycle, um, you guys know with our, with our federal grants, um, community assessment data is something that we're constantly kind of going back to and reflecting on. 
um, all throughout the year, and especially when we're preparing for the grant application. But not just that, I mean, just a part of how we program and how we decide and, and make decisions for our program. Um, we should be doing that heavily reliant on data that's in front of us. And so I do want um, to go ahead and acknowledge that, you know, those, those annual updates are so important to that community assessment um, and just making sure that you have the most up-to-date data on the communities in which you serve, um, that you understand the population around you and how it's moving, how it's shifting and how it's forever changing. Um, that's gonna be critical for you as you plan forward and make decisions on behalf of your programs. Um, community assessment also is one of those things that we take into consideration as we're going into a self-assessment um, as well. And so our self-assessment um, is something that uh, that is coming up. Our very first meeting um, is going to be January the 26th um, for self-assessment. For self and so um, we have managed to um, recruit, um, you know, some of you um, who will be on the grantee self-assessment team. I just wanna thank you guys for um, wanting to be a part of the self-assessment team. I think that um, those individuals who've been around for a while, you can um, you know, continue to evolve in those roles. Those who are new, we welcome you to go ahead and learn um, how the grantee puts together our self-assessment and definitely seeks um, the input um, from all of those who are participating. We do have one spot that is available under the self-assessment committee, um, and that is for a partner organization. And so um, if you are a partner organization, um, we are definitely looking to, uh, to go ahead and get one more seat filled on our self-assessment team. And so we're looking for an organization that is considered a partner um, to one of our delegates. And so if that's you and you're interested in um, know, knowing more and maybe doing more in that space, um, and the self-assessment really is about, you know, how we see ourselves, um, that we're not waiting for our monitoring team to come in. We have to do that anyway, right? But how do we see ourselves? Um, we look in the mirror and um, look at what we see. Do we like what we see? You know, how is our program being ran? Um, you know, are there improvements that need to be made, identifying what those things are? And ultimately, you know, if there are some improvements that can be made that we're going to wind up kind of wrapping it up um, with creating, um, you know, action plans and, you know, making sure that we have goals going into um, the next planning cycle. And if that all sounds interesting to you and it sounds like something that you want to be a part of, we do ask um, that you, you know, you can let us know. You can put something in the chat. You can send me an email. Um, but uh, we are looking for um, at least one more uh, participant on that self-assessment um, committee. January 26th is the, is the first date of the meeting. So hope to hear from you. If I don't hear from anybody, I'll do outreach and I'll, I'll go ahead and tap you on the shoulder privately. Uh, the next topic I wanted to talk about is program governance. Um, so Rachel mentioned staff changing and this is one of the areas in which we've experienced change. Um, I know that a lot of you guys are familiar with um, uh, Tasha Smith. And so Tasha Smith is no longer in children's services. And so she is with the city, but she's not in children's services. And so um, we are definitely evolving as far as governance is concerned. And governance is something that is uh, shared um, among several different staff people. And so we just want you to be aware um, that, that even with governance, things are changing. But we want you to know that we're staying on top of our commitment um, to you, um, to uh, you know, as delegate agencies, um, our families um, and children in this space. And we wanna always make sure that our um, policy council is going to be thriving. And we've done really well. Um, there is um, a couple of um, letters of certification that are still outstanding. You know who you are. Um, and I need to make sure that you guys, um, you know, get those to us. One of the things that the letters of certification um, and the policy committee tracking form it does for us is one, it lets us know how early in the year have you established your parent committee, your policy committee, and of course had the elections um, for your policy committee, but also for the citywide positions for the delegated alternate. Um, you know, this information is critical for us to know that things are moving in the right direction, um, that you're on task and on target with making sure that governance is running in your respective organizations. The individuals um, who have uh, submitted um, their policy committee rosters um, and to us, 
and as well as the letters of certification. Um, we do have you on file. We will start to make sure that we're including you in communication. So as we're sending it out to um, the, the elected uh, individuals who are delegates and alternates from your respective agencies, we're also gonna be communicating with the program governance um, staff that are on file to make sure that you guys can help support um, the respective delegates and alternate that come from your organizations and to be able to help them uh, with understanding their role, their roles and responsibilities, um, and overall just, just attendance and making sure that we're keeping them engaged. Um, so we appreciate you. We do want you to know um, that if there's ever any changes um, to those um, rosters that you've submitted us, or if the delegate or alternate changes, um, that you update um, that information and resend it in to us. We wanna make sure that we have the most current information on file. Um, and so when changes happen, just make sure that you get us a revised um, roster and uh, a revised letter of certification um, as needed. The next item I do wanna mention um, is regarding um, a couple of different uh, contracts that are gonna be coming your way. Um, and this is all related to uh, coronavirus um, relief funds. And so the first one is ARP, it's the American Rescue Plan. Um, there is a program instruction that the Office of Head Start issued. Um, and it's actually, um, it was issued back in, back in May. Um, but it talks about um, ARP funds, it talks about the CARES funds, and it also talks about what we're calling CURSA funds, the C-R-R-S-A, uh, CURSA. And so within that memo, it does talk about all three of those funding streams. Um, the, the funds are um, to help uh, to mitigate um, and to fight um, the coronavirus itself. And so those mitigation strategies um, that should be happening within your organizations to try and keep uh, staff, family, um, families and, uh, and children safe. Um, and I really want you to take time to, to read the program instruction because I think it's powerful. But uh, one of the things I do want to highlight is there's three big buckets of, of work that the federal government really wants us to support. Um, and I want to make sure that you guys are aware that we're in full support um, of what the program instruction is asking us, right? And so one of the things um, is to reach more families. Um, we understand at this point that we are experiencing under enrollment and it can be for many different reasons. The coronavirus itself may be a big reason why we're ex experiencing um, under enrollment. And so what the federal government is saying is, hey, I want you to reach more families. I want you to enroll and recruit. My deputy mentioned recruitment. Hey, what do those recruitment plans look like? She was talking about in terms of staff, but also in terms of you know, when we talked about those numbers in terms of the children that are enrolled and the families that are enrolled, we want to make sure that we're recruiting, um, you know, families into our program. We know that there's families out there who, who do need the services that we provide. And um, we have to make sure that we have a strategy for making sure that we're reaching more families. And so um, it's important for us to make sure that money um, that, that we're going to be spending from these coronavirus relief funds are going to be to support your increased enrollment and also um, increased recruitment efforts to, to get more families who are eligible into the program. In addition to reaching more families, we also want to make sure that if there's mental health supports that are needed for children and families, that we're being uh, cognizant and we're putting uh, the money where it's going to be needed to help support the families that we do have in our program. Um, there's Again, I want you to take, take time to read the program instructions, absolutely, but I just wanted to kind of highlight that, that you know, one of the big buckets was making sure that we're reaching more families. The second big bucket that I wanted to mention um, was getting our facilities ready for in-person instruction. Obviously, you know, we're at a point where uh, most of our facilities um, are absolutely open and um, we have had some shutdowns um, due to uh, mitigating the spread of the coronavirus, but um, we wanna make sure that we're doing whatever that we need to do in order to um, you know, have in-person learning be successful. And so um, in, the, in the program instruction itself, it does talk about things that we can do such as 
um, improving ventilation to reduce the risk of indoor transmission, to make facilities safer. Those are things that we can absolutely do. Of course, cleaning supplies and other services. Um, if there's any uh, minor renovations or space modifications that we need to do in order to keep children, uh, children safe within our programs, we can absolutely look into doing those types of things. Um, outdoor learning and play, and play space as well. Um, again, you know, preparing our, our facilities, preparing for in-person um, in -person comprehensive services is what this money should be also used for. And then the third thing I wanted to mention was um, supporting Head Start employees. Um, you know, there is an entire section within this uh, program instruction that talks about supporting our employees, um, you know, planning sessions for staff, um, as we're also preparing them for uh, the return of in-person in uh, comprehensive services as well. Staff wellness and then helping them uh, with mental health supports as well. Um, so there's things that we can do uh, in, in addition to vaccine supports um, that this money can be used for. And I just wanted to make sure that you guys know that, that the ARP, the $750 per child, um, it is coming for our federally funded programs. Um, and also the CURSA, uh, funds, $312 per child. Again, federal, it is coming for all staff. And yes, Linda, it is much needed, well needed. I uh, want you guys to know that that money is coming because I want you all to start internally, starting, starting to strategize, right? When you get these awards, what are you going to do? And these are conversations that you should be having internally. Please make sure that you um, read the program instruction. Um, Raniel, very important question. When, when will we get these funds? <laughs> This year, you're gonna, you're gonna get them this year. Actually, we have our attorneys uh, working on a, a boilerplate um, for, for these particular funds. And so um, we, we do want these, uh, these funds uh, to be utilized um, in 2020. And so uh, we're looking to get those awards out to you uh, real soon. I was hoping to have them out for January, January through November um, is the time frame um, that I was looking for. So January to November. Um, and if I need to make any modifications to that, I'll let you guys know. Um, I'm just waiting on um, our law department to go ahead and um, and to uh, get us a boilerplate. That, that's really what I'm waiting on. And so the quicker they can go ahead and do that, the quicker we can go ahead and get the money in your hands so that you can spend it. Regardless, the allocations are already made. They're not gonna decrease if it takes longer for, um, you know, if it takes longer for law to go ahead and kind of get these boilerplates done, but I do want to make sure that these money get into your hands. Uh, Devana, yes, it is also for our home visiting programs as well that are federally funded. Um, and so if you get federal funds from us for home visiting, um, it will apply to every child um, who are federally funded. So Head Start, Early Head Start, uh, Early Head Start, Child Care Partnership and, and Expansion, um, whether you're center-based or home-based, it will apply. Um, and it's for the exact same dollar amount. Um, yep, and so the funds is for Head Start, Early Head Start, uh, CCP, um, and also expansion, uh, Angela. So uh, it is for federally funded programs. And so I just wanna emphasize that, um, um, but uh, the funds will be coming if you guys have any other uh, questions about it. Uh, please feel free to send me an email, give me a call. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about those funds. We're really excited to be able to get those, uh, those contracts out, out the door soon. Um, so that way you guys can start to, um, to mitigate and plan forward. Um, it's important to make sure that you have a plan. And so I, I know I said the word plan, but we do wanna make sure that now that you know the dollar amount that you have a plan in place on how you're gonna spend the funds. Um, and so that's going to be absolutely uh, mission critical. Um, we do have some CARES funds as well that we, um, uh, so, so in addition to that, there's, there's some CARES funding. We are still in, um, in the planning phase of how we're going to go ahead and, um, and create a spending plan for CARES. So just know that that is something um, that will be coming. Um, but I don't have any information to give you other than um, than that at this point, but we will be uh, getting out more information on how we're gonna spend those CARES dollars uh, that will ultimately affect all of the federally funded programs as well. Um, the next item I wanted to, uh, wanted to talk about uh, was the attendance policy um, modification. Um, for those who, who you know, have been kind of around for a while, using COPA for a while, or your staff have, 
um, then you know that um, attendance is something that should be you know, taken on a daily basis and you're trying to capture that information. Um, we do have a point where we go ahead and we actually have to close or shut down attendance for the previous month. So say for instance, um, uh, once we start to do our January report, typically uh, we would go ahead and not allow any changes on January as of February the 6th. And so the 6th was always kind of, you know, the date that we went by, the 6th of every month for the previous month. No changes could be made as of the 6th because we had to have time to go ahead and prepare our report and send it to our funder. So the change is that instead of the 6th, the system shutting down, we're actually going to have to shut down the system on the 5th. So it's one business day. And I know that may not seem like a lot, but it's a lot for us because it does give us uh, the time that we need in order to go ahead and put those reports together without making it a mad, mad rush every single month when we're trying to submit um, the, the enrollment reports to our funders. So it's, it's a one day shift, but it is a day that I need you to be aware of. I need you to make sure that you're preparing your staff. We will be putting out um, a, written, uh, a written memo to all because this is a policy shift for us. This is absolutely a change in how we operate. Um, as that one day, um, it may make a difference to you. Um, but I, you know, need you to understand that um, that that we need to go ahead and make it in order to go ahead and move forward with how we're able to respond and report to our funder. And so, um, attendance should be entered on a daily basis. We understand that there's exceptions to that, especially um, when there's movement. You're trying to, you know, maybe you submitted a ticket to us, and we understand those types of things. We'll go ahead and deal with that. All of those things are in our policy. Um, our sales manual kind of you know, speaks to um, those, those, those instances where there's gonna be exceptions to be made. But overall, I need everybody to understand that we're closing attendance on the 5th um, so that we can prepare our monthly report, uh, enrollment report. Um, so I appreciate it if you go ahead and kind of spread the word so everybody knows it won't be a surprise <laughs> uh, when it uh, comes February and, you know, folks are like, whoa, what happened? Wait, 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 you know. So um, just make sure that you're talking to uh, your COPA administrators um, at your sites so that they understand that a shift is coming. Um, and like I said, we're going to be putting out uh, a written um, policy um, modification as well. Um, in the chat, someone had mentioned um, PI funding for the, the CARES ARP at this point. Um, it is not uh, PI funding, and that's why I wanted to be very specific when I put federal. Um, all of the federal funds, we do have um, additional dollars for those federal grants. So our Head Start, Early Head Start, um, Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, and also Early Head Start Expansion. I do not have any funds um, from Chicago Public Schools or ISB for uh, ECBG, not at this time. If, if we wind up getting something, we'll definitely let you guys know, but at this time, I don't have any additional revenue um, coming from ECBG funds. Um, we will need to identify and submit our ARP plan to, to DFSS. That would be great, Scott. You know, I asked for you guys to develop a plan and, you know, so just as we're preparing, um, you know, to, to understand that this money is going to be coming our way, one of the things that we have to do is we have to be able to tell our story about how we affected change in our communities, how we affected change with our children and families in our program. What did we do to go ahead and, and, and make them better off, you know, in it, you know, with these funds than without the funds? What was I able to accomplish with these funds that I would not have been able to accomplish without the funds? We have to be able to go ahead and craft our story around these funds. And so I challenge all of you to make sure that you are um, developing your plans around these ARP funds, around these CURSA funds. Um, I know nobody had asked, but CURSA, you know, again, if you go ahead and read the program instruction, you know, it stands for Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations. Long, long name, but in essence, it's still CARES funding, right? And so the CARES funds was under um, the, um, the Trump administration, the CURSA funds was under uh, the Biden administration. Um, but it's the same, you know, it's, it's coronavirus relief funds all the way around. And so we do have to make sure um, that we're crafting our stories. What I will go ahead and do is put out 
um, an email um, to everyone to go ahead and let them know to draft your plan and to go ahead and send us a plan. Um, that would be greatly appreciated so that we understand how you plan on using uh, these funds to make the lives of your children and families and staff better than what it was before. So great one. Um, is DFSS providing an ARP template for funding and tracking? If not, I can share the one that we developed. Yeah, Catherine, share it with me and be more than happy to. Um, I developed a plan for, for DFSS overall on how we were gonna spend the funds. I have something internal that I use. Be more than happy to share with anyone fiscally who wants to contact me and say, Tiffany, hey, how do you budget for this? No problem. I love to share my, my tricks of the trade with anyone who, you know, who wants to know. Um, but as far as a template, no, I haven't developed a template, but I'd be more than happy to go ahead and kind of see what others are doing. And if you want to go ahead and get any resources from me in and around this, be more than happy to do that as well. All right. Okay. I see some takers. I see some volunteers. I want to thank everyone who is willing to volunteer to be on self-assessment. Thank you guys so much. Martise, thank you for going ahead and putting um, the volunteer form in the actual chat. And so for those who have reached out, you can go ahead and click on the Survey Monkey link to go ahead and add your information in. Um, and that way we can contact you, uh, the team can contact you um, so that we'll have your information on file. Um, if there's any other questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. Um, I think I've answered most of them in the chat, but if I haven't, I just wanna give a pause to have anybody unmute if there's something that I need to address. Okay, all right, good deal, good deal. Thank you guys so much. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the baton. Um, well, actually, I think this is me too. <laughs> so enrollment, I, I'm not passing it. I guess I'm gonna go ahead and give this update too. Uh, enrollment, so um, this is our enrollment update. Um, Head Start, uh, we're funded for 1,489 children in December. Um, our enrollment was at 1,357 children. So that's 91% enrolled. Our early Head Start, we're funded for 1,267 children, and we were enrolled at 970 uh, children. Um, that's 77% enrolled. Um, the Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, we're funded for 1,100, and we were enrolled at 765, 70% enrolled. Uh, expansion, um, Early Head Start Expansion, we're funded for 200, and we were enrolled at 150. Um, that's three-fourths. So 75%. Um, and PFA, um, Preschool for All, we're funded for 5,935. Uh, we were enrolled in December at 4,078 uh, children. That's 69% enrolled. Um, and our PI center base, uh, we're funded for 3,100 and enrolled uh, 2,183. That's 70%. And PI home base, um, we're funded for 1,658, uh, enrolled at 1,237, so 75% enrolled. Um, these numbers, we definitely like to bring these numbers to you and so you can see them uh, on, a, on a monthly basis so that you understand that we do have some work to do. So as I mentioned before, um, reaching more families is one of the goals of ARP and CURSA funds. And so, you know, Definitely enrollment, um, it, it, it definitely can improve, we see here. Um, I want you guys to know that I have people contact me all the time asking, Tiffany, can I get more slots? I see that you're under-enrolled. Tiffany, can I get more slots? The only way for me to give people more slots, and I want everybody to hear this, is if I take them back from somebody else, okay? Because I don't have slots just sitting with me. So in order for me to give you more slots, I have to take them back from somebody else, which means what? That reduces your contract. That reduces the opportunity that you have for future enrollment, right? But the reality is continued under enrollment, we have to eventually have those conversations. And I've been very reluctant. I know that we're in a pandemic, it's very hard. Um, and I haven't, I've been very reluctant to be able to, to, to pull back slots from folks. But I do want you to know, that there's agencies out there, if you look to the left, look to the right, you kind of look up and down on this screen here, they want your slots because they're like, hey, I can fill them. I can fill them. 
I know you're under enrolled because you keep showing me these under enrollment reports and I want those slots. Um, the only way I can do that is having a serious conversation with those who are under enrolled about if you're not able to fill them, then I have to go ahead and take them back and give them to somebody who, who has demonstrated to me that they have the ability to go ahead and enroll. And those are gonna be difficult conversations to have because I wanna be sensitive, especially during the pandemic. Um, at the same time, um, we do have to make sure that we're being good stewards of, of the funding that we're receiving. And so um, if things are shifting in a way that we have to make those hard decisions, um, then you will get a private conversation um, from Saratha and I um, about the, the movements that we'll have to make. Um, but those are very difficult conversations. They won't be easy. Um, but I do wanna just say that loudly because people do contact me about receiving more slots. And it's very difficult for me to explain to them that those slots are tied in contracts. And even though they're not filled, they're still tied in a contract. And the an only way I can go ahead and give them more slots if I take them back from you who are under enrolled. So sit with that um, and just understand that, you know, there may be some, some private conversations that have to be had, um, but the enrollment does need some improvement and uh, we need to work together in order to maximize those opportunities to enroll. And where we know we absolutely cannot enroll, that we have to have an honest conversation about giving slots back. All right. I'm going to go ahead and pass it to um, health and safety updates. Who's up next? Kick it, kick it over to B. All right, all right. B is all yours. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, directors. Good morning, Sarita. Uh, thanks again for giving us an update about what you've been doing. We're glad that you're back. We're glad that you're with us. And we know a lot of agencies. A lot of families are dealing with COVID right now. And so the update that I wanted to provide is that, um, as you probably heard on the news, the government just went live with the website for free at home, over the counter, COVID tests. You're allowed to get up to four per household. Um, but what we need to impress upon our families is that there are a lot of scams out there. So what we want them to know is that these tests are free. They are at no cost to them, whether they have insurance or they're under insurance, um, that anyone can get these tests in their house. And so we provided the website there for you, www.covidtests.gov. So please uh, get these, it's vital. Um, this is a relatively new section, health and safety updates, but we look forward to being able to bring you um, more information on health and safety related issues. So with that, I believe I turn it over to program operations. Father, so whoever goes for quiet. Thanks. It's over to William. Perfect. Thank you, B. Thank you, Sarito. Good morning, um, City Partners. Uh, first, I would like to apologize for the um, the lack of my the lack of the operation of my camera this morning. Um, but luckily, I do have audio so that I can share a few updates um, as you see on your screen. We're happy to announce that our uh, twenty fiscal year twenty two uh, this program this uh, um, college school year um, um, uh, application for our Chicago Early Learning Workforce Scholarship opened um, early this week, Monday or Tuesday. And um, by Tuesday afternoon, um, received an update from our partners over at City Colleges. We have already had 115 submissions for, for applicants uh, looking to, to um, seek degrees, uh, um, level up in credentials, and also that all held um, with the ECE endorsement. Um, so that's really great news. Uh, we still have opportunities for uh, potential scholars to submit their applications. Um, I'm going to ask at this time if, if, if my team member Peggy um, could go ahead and post that link to the scholarship application in the chat so that therefore you may um, save it to your desktop and, and share it out accordingly to your staff. Um, again, that's great news. We're definitely looking forward to uh, um, to working with more of our, our teachers that's in the field. Um, 
um, professionals entering our field um, to, to therefore fill that gap um, that we're seeing across the board as it relates to our, our workforce. Um, Sarato had, had mentioned a lot of as it relates to ECBG, um, so I won't go into that, um, but I did want to share out the date for that ECBG uh, uh, EDPD meeting. It is February 3rd. Um, but prior to that, our team will continue to reach out to individual agencies at this point in time um, to provide one-on-one -on -one intensive TA sessions to go ahead and, and, and get your records caught up. Um, again, if, you, if you're saying you have um, 200 children enrolled in PFA uh, or your PI program, we're looking to have those 200 complete records um, um, and as it relates to the, uh, as Sarito had mentioned earlier in the presentation, the city addresses, the teachers linked to a classroom in COPA with the IEIN numbers as well. Um, so please look out for those individual invites to any agencies that we see are still, um, uh, you know, uh, still have some incomplete data as it relates to that, re to that reporting. Um, class observations, um, as you know, we're, we're, we're gearing up. Um, Happy to, we're, we're still in between, as you know, we're still in the pandemic. So you will see there for our class observations, we, we still need to embark on observing our classroom. Um, so right now we are still looking to hold these observations virtually. But again, as always, we're optimistic that one day we can get back to, to, to holding these in-person services um, that are so beneficial to our programs and, and furthermore, ultimately our children and their outcomes. Um, also, we're, we're happy to announce that we're bringing back our TSG coaching models for this program year. And at this time, um, I know we did send out surveys to, um, uh, please excuse that typo there, the survey was not sent in the CSD update, it was sent directly to our agencies and education coordinators, and also um, uh, um, individuals, uh, coaches, education coordinators, and those individual agencies that we know uh, re reply uh, as, as seeking to to want to benefit from our coaching models for teachers and coaches. So we're offering two tracks as it relates to our TSD coaching um, for teachers and coaching. So coaches, coaches can be education coordinators, site directors, and uh, even most cases, some program directors as well. Um, so at this time, um, again, Peggy has been sending out those emails. Uh, Peggy, I don't know if you want to go ahead and pop that link in there as well. Uh, but please, uh, thank you so much. But please uh, make sure you complete that link so that we can get you guys registered for these upcoming TSG trainings. Also, <clears throat> Dr. Beverly, may I have more information on coaches. Um, yeah, so a lot of our agencies, uh, a lot of agencies have different org structures um, as it relates to our education, instruction, and teaching. Um, a lot of agencies use coaches. Um, some call them infantile specialists, um, some call them education coordinators. Um, so those individuals who work within curriculum and instruction, we, we, we put them under the umbrella of coaches. Um, also, I know that there was some conversation in the chat earlier about our upcoming job fair. Um, that window has closed um, as it relates to um, providing your agency's information, as it relates to the open positions you have, um, your link to your job board, or that person in which uh, potential uh, uh, staff can, can contact. However, while this window has closed, we are also working on another opportunity to support our partner agencies in, in filling the gap as it relates to the workforce. And there'll be more to come as we begin to build out this uh, second iteration of our, uh, our workforce or our job fairs and, and uh, opportunities to share out your needs. And I think that would also be part of our agenda for our February 3rd PFA and PI only uh, sites. And that wraps, that wraps up quality updates. I do have one in the chat. I think it was Dr. Beverly again, excuse me. Um, where was the deadline posted for the job fair? Um, so, so I did mention in, in last month's EDPD um, about the about the job fair. I, went, I asked that you know I put my email and my information in the system. I'm asking that you can give me that information over. Um, right as of right now, that opportunity had closed as I mentioned before. But we did also send out another survey earlier this week, 
And Dr. Beverly, I, if you're requesting it, uh, I see you're requesting it. More information, I'll make sure I forward that over to you as well, um, so that therefore you can get on get in on this next iteration of our job fair and um, opportunities to hire employees. That wraps for me. Thank you, Saretha. All right, I, I know Nicole is on. Nicole, are you going to do the expenditure rates? Yes, good morning, right. everyone. Thank you. Uh, so our expenditure rates for our November 30th ended federal grants are 87% um, for Head Start and Early Head Start and 66 and 65% for CCP and expansion. Um, those rates are pretty reflective of the um, enrollment percentages. So I'm optimistic that as uh, through the enrollment efforts that we will uh, increase our expenditures. Moving on to our state funded grants. Um, we are currently, uh, these grants started July 1st and uh, we have a 19% expenditure rate for ECBG and 24% for child care. So um, I encourage you to please get your vouchers in, um, submit them monthly. Uh, those, are, those rates are low for where we are currently within the budget period. So um, if you have any issues uh, with submitting invoices, please reach out to your finance accountant and, and we'll be happy to assist you. For our FY21 closeout, uh, invoices were due for our federal programs. If for any reason you have um, any remaining, please reach out as soon as possible to your finance accountant. Um, uh, we're closing out the 21 calendar year. So this also includes our CRF and um, corporate RTL invoices uh, will need to be submitted uh, by January 28th. Uh, for our FY22 grants, um, we are currently processing the initial budgets and your accountants will reach out to you as soon as your budget is approved so that you can move forward with vouchering. Uh, what we're asking now is that if you can please prepare your invoices um, and have them ready for submission um, as soon as your budget is approved, that would definitely assist with um, uh, movement of the invoice at this time. Um, Probably over the next few months, our voucher audit team, uh, VATS at the comptroller's office will have an influx of vouchers due to um, the year end closeout. Um, so they are going to move through those vouchers as um, best as they can, uh, first in, first out. Um, child care and uh, PIPFA, uh, you should have your invoices submitted through the period covered of December 31st. Again, any 2021 expenses um, invoices will need to be submitted by the 28th. If you have um, any concerns with uh, submitting your 2021 invoices, please reach out to your finance accountant as soon as possible. And on this last slide, I have um, the link again to the iSupplier um, training and reference materials. And there's also um, dates for live trainings that are updated there. So um, you can refer to, to that site for a very helpful material. If anything is not clear, or if you need additional assistance, you can reach out to your finance accountant. And um, here I have a list of the finance accountant by program. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, thanks, Nicole. Can you do me one favor? Uh, sure. Mara, whom, not, not you, Nicole, but thank oh. you. Whomever yeah. is the driver on the slides, can you go back to the ECBG expenditures, please? Thank you. And so again, I started off by talking about our issues with our early childhood black grant. This, this fund, and I know, and again, I'm gonna you know, defer and say that there may be some issues with getting contracts out the door, but we're in January of 2022 on a grant that ends June 30th. And what we have in our system is only 19% expended. And so if you are on the other side of this and you are funded by these dollars, 
there's a massive amount of money that is still on the table. An $81 million grant and only 15, 15 million of that has been expended. We can't turn back another $12 million. We just simply cannot. We've got work to do, and I know we're gonna help you, we're gonna meet with you, we're gonna talk about it, we're gonna figure it out. But we have five months left um, in this contract year for these funds to be expended. And five months to try to figure out how to get um, $60 million out the door. That's gonna be difficult on your part and difficult on ours, um, but we can't keep turning money back to the state. I can tell you right now um, that Looking at it, it looks like we don't need $81 million at DFSS to support all of your programs. That's what it looks to our funder. Um, and if we don't figure out a way to bill and voucher monthly so that we can stay on top of this, we are required to report monthly um, to CPS on our expenditures with the mayor's office there. So they know that these dollars are not going out the door. And so there are many, many discussions about the how to and the why. And I understand we've had some systems issues and like, like Nicola said, as you need any help, please reach out and we'll do everything we can to support you. But people, I can't say it enough, five months left to get about $60 million out of the door in order for us not to be putting money back in the hands of the state of Illinois, because it goes back to CPS at the end of the funding year, which means they can't do anything with those dollars as well. And then we're sitting here wishing that we had made sure that we had given and done something about a budget revision. And so that's why we're having a meeting with you to talk about it, to try to figure out, do we need to do budget revisions to see what the connection is to your staff? Uh, because we know some of that is true to see what the connection is for enrollment, to see what that is so that we have a story that we can say what's going on. There's a serious impact here where we're sitting in January um, with this much um, under, under expended. Um, on that particular grant. C CCAP, same issue, um, but the ECBG grant, I'm hoping that you can see this big on your screen as I see it big on mine, um, that we really have some work to do people and we'll be working with you. Uh, but the plan is to get these dollars out of the door and into your hands uh, because you're the one serving those children and families and we wanna make sure that we're able to do that. Uh, so I will get off of my soapbox. Um, Elaine, I see your hand up. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it over to you. Okay, well, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I just have a, a couple of program operations uh, clarifiers to, to share with you um, based on the information that was shared during this meeting. I wanna go back to Serapo's point and Will's point about the early childhood block grant and the data entry information. So I'm looking at this from a systemic point of view, right? It's a record keeping and an internal monitoring issue um, at the agency level. And so what we're asking you to do is make sure that you effectively communicate this information with your respective staff, right? To say, hey, you know, these data entry points need to be completed thoroughly and accurately. What that also means is that whoever your data entry specialist is, there should be someone who goes behind that person to ensure that that information is entered accurately, right? And so based on your internal monitoring system, you should be at least looking at this information uh, at least once a month to make sure that those data entry points are accurate and complete. And I encourage you to go back to the PFA PI training a, a PowerPoint presentation that the data team did for you so that you can have a clear understanding about what those mandatory fields are and how those fields connect to different questions that need to be completed accurately. So that was my major point as it relates to the Early Childhood Block Grant PFA PI data entry measures, right? It's a record keeping issue across the board for our PFA PI programs. And so you need to make sure that you're doing some type of quality spot checks to ensure that that data is accurate. I wanna speak in relationship to um, the COVID-19 vaccine data. So where these dates can be entered are in the COPA HR medical records file. 
So COPA has updated uh, this platform to include the date of staff's first vaccine, the second vaccine, and the booster if they get the booster. Um, as the Rachel said, there has been no guidance about um, it being required, but I encourage you, you know, based on uh, uh, personal experiences with COVID and, and what has been shared through today's meeting, follow your doctor's advice regarding that COVID-19 uh, 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 booster shot. And so you can enter that information in the staff medical record, as well as the type of vaccine they receive. And if they received an exemption, what type of exemption, and if that exemption has an expiration date. Right now, we are just asking you to enter this information into the staff COPA HR medical file or medical record. We're not asking you to upload the staff's um, exemption, nor are we asking you to upload the card that they receive once they receive their vaccination shots. Uh, we'll send more guidance on that a little later on. The second item I want to address that was discussed during um, this morning's meeting um, is subs. Where do you document subs um, in the COPA system? Again, that is in the COPA HR file, the employee information. There's a, a, a field that says employment type. An employment type, there's a drop down box where it says temporary contracted collaborating partner year round full time, temporary full time. I am going to uh, uh, defer to my colleague, uh, Craig Zimke, um, in data because I know this information also ties back into the COPA PIR, the PIR document. And so I just want to be accurate to say which one of these um, field drop-down uh, identifiers should be used for substitute teachers. It could be temporary staff or it could be year-round. It could be temporary full-time staff. It would be one of those two selections for those subs. And I'll ask Craig to, either, to, to confirm that for me um, if, if that is accurate as related to IR. Yeah, I mean, there's been some discussion about this, but in, in the end, you're, you're correct. We should be putting them in under employment type as temporary staff um, rather than permanent staff. And that should allow you to, to make that distinction. Uh, but in the discussion, we have been trying for several years to get to get everyone to put all of the substitute teachers in. And there's a lot of resistance for people putting in someone under a job title that is not an employee. So what we have very recently done is added in the system the job titles of temp, um, substitute teacher and substitute teacher assistant. So if you don't want to call them a teacher, we've mapped them to the same place behind the scenes in our report so we can see who is in the system. So if you feel more comfortable identifying them in that way, you can use that job title. Um, but we, we still need every single one of two things, every single, every single person who is in the classroom in front of children in the system as the uh, as as a teacher, substitute teacher, what have you. Or we need to for a classroom where it looks like it's vacant and there's no teacher in there, we need you to close that room because we cannot have a classroom that doesn't have a teacher in it. For one thing, when we are we are in the midst of trying to do this now, when we report to ISB on the the PFA and PI programs, we literally cannot report a child as enrolled in the system if there is no associated teacher. The system doesn't allow that. When you put it, when you submit information on a child, it wants to know who the teacher is. So every teacher position needs to be filled. And if you want to identify them as a substitute, then identify them as a substitute. <laughs> is that clear? Thank you, Craig. And so um, what, what we'll do is we'll we'll work together to get you out a little a little cheat sheet based on what Craig just said so that you can be able to um, uh, actually identify the subs um, who will be working in your programs. And just a gentle reminder, as we are, we have temporary teachers in our classroom, um, make sure that they have their criminal background checks, that they they are cleared. Make sure if they're in your PFA classrooms or your PI classrooms that they have 
uh, the IEIN numbers that's, that's needed for them to be in that classroom. So you're gonna enter your document, you're, you're gonna document your information for these substitute teachers accordingly um, as you would do for a permanent staff person. I wanna move on to the last question that was asked um, as it relates to parent meetings for PFA uh, PI programs. Um, yes, our PFA PI programs should be having um, parent meetings, right? And those parent meetings um, uh, would support um, making sure that you are sharing information with your parents as it relates to uh, parent education, and uh, parent involvement um, in your respective PFA programs um, that align with the ISB um, family engagement requirements. And you can, tie, you can tie this information back into your scope of service because it's documented there as well, um, as well as in the sales of uh, 2.0 under the section of collaborative governance. Now for our PFA PI programs, just let me be clear, the governance structure that is required for our Head Start, Early Head Start, Early Head Start CCP programs, you don't have that in-depth requirement where you have to have a chair, a vice chair, you have to vote on uh, 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 program items, but you must have uh, parent committees at your respective sites so that you can be able to um, engage them in family involvement uh, activities, um, parent education, um, and it also aligns with uh, the DCFS requirement for uh, parent meetings as well. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Sorrento. Thanks, Elaine. Um, I've been trying to, as we were doing this, responding to some of the questions in the chat, and I was actually um, writing one back to you, San, regarding um, a CPS and their expansion. Um, one, oh, excuse me, one of the things I want to remind everyone, it's been now three years uh, that we've been in an expansion of universal preschool, where CPS has um, expanded into communities and opened up additional classrooms, and they've been doing it based on what they could see as far as the number of children um, in communities to be served. CPS um, has been focusing on four-year-olds, old, four year olds, and we've been asking all of you to focus on three-year-olds, um, and we know that there's... Um, a wait list out there, three-year-olds that are not being served. So we are still having conversations uh, with CPS um, around some of those concerns about, you know, why are there three-year-olds still not um, enrolled in programs? Um, there's going to be a lot of discussions regarding uh, the next iteration of um, all of this in community, and we will consistently bring information to you. Uh, we had given a report before, and we can go back and I'll put that report out there again, where it shows you where uh, CPS's plans were um, uh, to actually move and open up new classrooms. And I know uh, to your point, Son, it is one near your site. I, I know that. Um, and I know you and I have talked about that as well. Um, and so the goal was to, ex if there's an expansion into a community, it was an expansion in a community where there were many more children to be served so that the both and, meaning CPS and your program could both thrive in that community because we needed more seats, more seats in that, in that community uh, to allow for all children to be served. And we know um, that it's not necessarily working um, the way that we want because one of the things that happens is um, we then have parents who want to put their children in programs um, and the CPS, for example, can offer a full day of preschool Whereas in many of your programs, sometimes there's a co-payment or something attached to that. Um, and so we're still working out some, some of this. And this you know, is something that we've been working on for years and we're gonna continue to work on this. Um, I know that CPS has opened up the classrooms they intended to open in the city of Chicago. And I know that they have let us know about some of their um, uh, buildings where they are underutilized. Um, and some of the plans were you know, to expand where some of the, classrooms are right now underutilized. And so there's gonna be more dialogue around some of how we might be able to partner. Your question is who can we talk to? Just know uh, DFSS, CPS and the mayor's office, we have a Tuesday meeting where we, we meet weekly uh, talking about all of this. Because again, as we were starting this, we wanted to make sure that we were all talking to each other and we've been talking to each other um, through this process. Now, is talking to each other, stopping either of us from opening a, opening a classroom. Um, of course it has not, because one of the things that we know 
um, the data shows is that there are other children um, out there that still need to be served. We have not reached a capacity level where every three or four year old um, is enrolled in the seat. And as long as we continue to have wait lists, uh, we're gonna still be talking about this. And right now we do have wait lists of three year olds. Um, and so one of the things that we need to do is talk about what we do. Althea just dropped in a question. Uh, you've got three year olds, however, their birth date is after September 1, what do we do? Um, a child whose birth date is after um, really is still a PI or early Head Start age child because they have not turned three. Three by September 1 makes them eligible for the next iteration of that age group. And if you don't offer that other program, uh, then Althea, we need to talk about what it is you are able to do within your program regarding those children. Uh, some children, because they just were born, you know, on the fourth of the month, means that they can actually get an extra year of um, Head Start or uh, PFA because of their birth dates. And so we can talk a little bit more offline about that, Althea. Um, you can reach out to me via email and we can talk a little bit more so I could understand a little bit more um, of work, what's working in your program. But again, we need to continue to work on this. We need to continue to partner together. Um, we need to look at what are our recruitment efforts in every one of our communities um, to see what else we might be able to do to encourage parents to enroll in our programs. Um, again, we are in some cases, not only are there CPS schools right across, but I also know, and I think we talked about it before, how some of you are literally across the street from each other as well. And so, you know, there's still a lot of children in Chicago that's not being served. And we wanna make sure that we've come up with ways and thoughts about how we might be able to do some of that. And so again, if you've got some specific questions more, son, I say, send me an email. I know we've talked before. I'd love to continue to talk to you about it um, for advocacy reasons and all of that. Um, and Althea, again, reach out to me uh, via email and like, let's talk a little bit more um, about what you're able to do within your program so we can talk about what some of the possibilities are. Um, I've been trying to be mindful of the chat box as we were going through this. I don't see, um, you're very welcome, son. I don't see any other questions right now that I don't think either I or my staff have not responded to. Um, but I will say that we are not quite at noon yet. And so if we miss something and someone wants to uh, unmute, uh, you can unmute yourself um, and ask your question so I can make sure that you don't walk away uh, with a question that was unanswered. And so I'll, I'll hesitate for a moment to see if there's any. Not hearing any, and my staff will tell you, um, I don't necessarily wait a long time because your time is valuable. Um, not seeing any questions coming into the chat box other than those we've responded to, not hearing anyone unmuting and asking a question. What I wanna do is say to each and every one of you, thank you for, um, there is one that just came in. Let me hold on for one second. Will there be any uh, COPA training upcoming? Um, there's been training. We'll continue to do trainings at different times. Um, Angie, if there's something specific that you feel you need or your staff needs, uh, please reach out to us and let us know what it is so that we can try to figure out um, if that's a training that we're already planning. And I always say, if one person needs it, there's probably more people who need it. Uh, so reach out to your staff, your lead um, um, in operations, let them know uh, what it is you think you need, um, and we'll see what we might be able to do. And if there's something specific you need, we can always do some one-on-one -on -one TA if we need to. Um, so again, I thank everybody. I thank every one of you. Your time is valuable. You're very busy people out there. Um, and to give up almost, you know, two hours of your time on a pre-Friday. Uh, Pre-Friday works for me because, you know, I, I have to stay in the right frame of mind to do another day this week. It's been a long week already. Um, but what I want to do is say, again, I am, I respect what each and every one of you do every day. And I know your jobs are not easy. They have not been easy pre-COVID. And then we added a pandemic to that. Um, and on top of that, um, in our communities and everything that's going on in our communities that adds to your burden, all I can do is say thank you, thank you, thank you to each and every one of you. You are the reason that many of our parents are able to get up in the morning, feel that they have a safe network of people who care about them, that feel that there's somewhere that their children can go and be safe. 
I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. And if I don't say it enough, just know I am 110% in your corner. I know what you're doing. I fight for you every day. That's why I'm here in this seat is to fight on your behalf to make sure we're doing the right things for our most vulnerable citizens in the communities that we serve. And so on this Thursday, I say thank you. I commend you. Please say to your staff that I thank them. It was my plan to come and visit all of you. And then there was a pandemic. So I haven't been able to get out there, but to two places so far. Um, but I, did, I do want to come out and just put my face and I want to shake hands and say thank you. Bump elbows, I'll do that too. Um, but, you know, we have a responsibility here at DFSS to support you. And I want to know that what you're getting from us supports you. And so, you know, I'm doing everything I can to make sure that we're doing everything that we can um, from our side. If there's more that you need from us, don't hesitate. Let me know. Um, email me, call me, whatever you got to do. I'm here for you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy your Friday, your weekend. But my big ask of all of you is do me a favor, do yourselves and your families a favor and just say, stay safe and be well. Love to see you um, in another month. Some of you a little bit sooner than that as we do ECBG, uh, but understand I'm here for you. We are here for you. My team is here for you. And I just want you to enjoy as your children enjoy every day. Every time I see something that comes through my door, um, I see the smiles on children. So believe me, I know what you're doing every day and the impact uh, that you have on our children and our families. And so if you're not getting it from everybody else or anybody else, know that I thank you. Um, so enjoy the rest of your pre-Friday um, and please stay safe and be well, everyone. And I'll talk to you soon.